in continuing with our study of the New Testament regarding the marks found therein that help us identify the church that Jesus built. We want to look today at the Lord's Supper. I want to use as a text Paul's writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. I use that because Paul, writing to that church, is in the process of correcting them in abuses of the Lord's Supper. This evidence is the fact that they saw the need to engage in the observance of the Lord's Supper. But in so doing, they were abusing it and misusing it. And we see Paul refer back to its institution by the Lord himself. And then he quotes that to them in this passage. One of the things that will stand out in the very beginning from this passage concerning this identifying mark of the church of which we read in the New Testament, the Lord's church, is that the church of our Lord observes the Lord's Supper as a wonderful, sweet, memorial feast of the Lord's death. It's sacred, and it's holy, and worthy of our minds being centered on what it's all about. That's not to take away from the singing, or the prayers, or the purposing and thinking about our giving as we decide what we will as an act of worship or in the attitude we ought to have toward the study of the Bible or listening to sermons as it's taught, as they're taught. But it does say that without the death of Jesus Christ, everything about what we do is worthless. Now, I know you can say that about the resurrection of Christ. Paul even makes that argument. If Christ be not raised, then our faith is vain. But there would be no resurrection from the dead unless Christ Die. So Paul writes, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Now if you go over to the Galatian epistle where he's defending his apostleship, he will tell you plainly, I didn't learn anything about the gospel from another man. But it was given to me by revelation of Jesus Christ. So here as he writes to the church at Corinth, the whole letter for that matter, He's saying what you're receiving from me came directly to me from the Lord by the Holy Spirit because I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am one of the ambassadors of the court of heaven that was called by Christ to deliver the doctrine of Christ. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you this do in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament or covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, that passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. American Standard Version, 1901. It's important as we break down the verse further to understand that he's saying to members of the church, this act of worship is in remembrance of me. That's mentioned twice, once here and in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 23. This is not all, of course, that the New Testament has to say about the Lord's Supper. I have to go to other passages addressing the Lord's Supper to understand the totality of the information God's delivered us through the inspired writers about this. Now, we look at a flower from a parent's grave or a grandparent's grave, and we do it in memory of one who's near and dear to us. We do things like that all the time. If you go to the state capital, even if you go to cities, but especially our national capital, you'll see all sorts of memorials, things that are set up to cause us to remember. Even uh, December 7th, 1941, that very date, as Roosevelt said, which would live in infamy, 
reminds us of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. There are a multiplicity of things like that. I have in my second semester world history book, which the reason I have it in that book is because both of those books, the first semester textbook and the second, were very thick books when I was a freshman in college. This would have been in the spring of 1965. My great-grandfather died in March of 1965. Uh, Matthew Holly's named after him, and I'm named after him. And off of his coffin in the funeral spray that was there, I took one of the flowers and I put it in that history book. And there it remains to this day. If I open it up, it's there. What do you think it calls to my mind? So this is not unusual. Notice the simplicity of it, but the power of it. And so it is when you understand as a child of God, one who's of Christ, a Christian, this particular memorial feast. So we gather around the Lord's table, and we take the Lord's Supper. We eat it in memory of Him who said, This do in remembrance of me, which we have all over the place, inscribed upon tables, primarily the design of which is to hold the emblems of the Lord's Supper to be passed to the congregation at the time that's going on. You have these things like the flower I mentioned, or even if they're granite monuments, given time and the ravages of time, they're all broken down and they will go to nothing. And not the Lord's Supper as a memorial to His death, it will not disintegrate. It will not transform. It will not be effaced by time. It is recorded in the word that Christ said, though heaven and earth pass away, my word will not pass away. As long as there are people who love the Lord and are obedient to him or members of his church and who abide in the teaching, the authority of the New Testament, when it comes down to remembering Christ's death, this memorial feast is there. So none of the grinding of the elements or things that usually do so will wear this out. It is a permanent standing in memory of Christ. Christ commanded it to be done in memory of him, as I've said. But it's easy, brethren, for us to forget Christ in the very thing he commanded us to remember him by. How do I know that? Well, going back to Old Testament Israel and those things highly significant to them in fleshly Israel, the great prophet Jeremiah in the waning days of Israel in their great and long-term apostasy as they were about to be destroyed, he said, can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And if you look around about those that claim to believe in God, Christ is their Savior, the Bible is the Word of God, who even assemble to worship God, they seem to forget the very memorial as it's taught in the Bible that focuses in on the death of Jesus Christ. They'll remember th everything else. Think about this time of year. Look at all that they're remembering now that the Bible doesn't even say. We ought to remember and even at a time that no man can prove Christ was born. But they'll remember that because too many of us, if not all of us at one time or another, although we hopefully learn better, some of us, we tend to do things like we like. So if Jesus were maybe speaking today or some prophet like Jeremiah, he'd say maybe can, um, can uh, the church forget its box suppers or can the church forget its... Uh, uh, Pageants, can the church forget its entertainment efforts? Uh, I've noticed down the street here, and you notice that if you want to, that they've erected a big circus-type tent, and uh, they're putting on something about learn the mystery of Christmas. Well, I might say it is a mystery when it comes to the Bible because not a thing in the world said about it in the Bible. That doesn't seem to bother them as they seek to extol Christ. Uh, certainly, I have nothing against Christmas or the 4th of July or April Fool's Day, for that matter, as a holiday. 
But I certainly have something against things not even found in the Bible when we say, Lord, you'll like it or not because it suits us. But that's the mentality of people. And it's not just in our generation, although it may be focused in on now as much as it ever has been in this nation. This Lord's Supper is a memorial which preaches Christ's death. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do you do? Ye proclaim or show forth the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. That's what we do. And when you partake of the emblems with the right disposition of mind, a mind that's been educated by the truth of the New Testament regarding the same, then as you partake of the bread, you're mindful of the fact that that represents the sinless body of Christ that he was tempted in every point like as we are without sin. He's the Lamb of God that went to the cross willingly and died for us. And when you partake of the fruit of the vine, you know that represents the blood that purchased the church, Acts 20, 28. The blood of the New Testament. The blood we all contacted in becoming Christians when we were baptized into his death where he shed his blood. It is the blood that continues to cleanse us from sin, 1 John 1, 7 as we walk in the light, as he's in the light. So we see that the Lord's Supper, in effect, is a silent witness of the great sacrifice of all the ages to make salvation from sin and the hope of heaven a reality to every one of us. Those who fail to take the Lord's Supper, as God teaches, simply silences that testimony and shows how little they really think about why God put it here in the first place. It's a memorial which preaches the second coming of Christ. Notice, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death, well, that's not all of it, is it? Till he come. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. How can I preach what the Bible teaches, specifically the New Testament, about the Lord's Supper, as one of the acts of worship on the first day of the week, and not be proclaiming His death till He come. That is, He is coming. And what are we to do as His children, members of His church? We're to be proclaiming His death, and we're to do it as long as we're on this earth. And as long as the earth is here and there are people that are on this earth, we're to do it. But you know, even, let's suppose there was no one on this earth. The Word of God still says that's the way God's people do it. And it will face us on the day of judgment. So from the retrospective view, it proclaims the Lord's death. From the prospective view, it is a weekly reminder. It's one of the acts of worship in the assembly of the saints of the Lord's people that says the Lord's coming again. And to the faithful, isn't that something to rejoice in? To deliver us from this veil of tears? Certainly it is. So it points backward to his death and forward to his coming. And we need the benefits derived from both. Because each helps us along with other things to be faithful and therefore ready whenever he comes. It is a memorial which preaches the new testament or covenant of Jesus Christ. Notice what is said by Paul to the church as he corrects them on their abuses because they just turned it into a, a meal in which some were left hungry and some were even drunken. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. This cup is the New Testament or covenant in my blood. We must remember that when you take these, this last section of the Bible called the New Testament, it's been sealed by the very blood of Christ. It is efficacious because of that. It is the perfect law of liberty because of that. It is the power of God to save us from sin because of that. Remove the shed blood of Christ. Thus you remove the death of Christ. And we see then there's nothing left for us. So this cup and cup there stands not for container but the contents. Because you can't drink the container. You can drink the contents. 
is a symbol of Christ's blood. It's the sign of the confirmation of a New Testament between God and man. Now the problem comes in to a great extent as far as churches that claim Christ as Savior and who worship God through Christ because they don't follow the teaching of the Scriptures concerning the New Testament being a divine pattern whereby God authorizes us what to do. So we need to look then at the frequency of observing the Lord's Supper. Now mind you, there are a lot of things about the Lord's Supper. Some I've already mentioned that helps each one of us Christians to be more mindful that our worship will be more effective and God will be more pleasing. But now the time of it is important. We might even raise the question, should there be any frequency and uh, regularity in observing this part of our worship to God? And if you answer, well, certainly there should be because you know the Bible principle of serving God is that all things ought to be done decently in order. But then if that's the case, who's going to regulate it? Who is going to regulate it? Is the church going to regulate it? Or is God, who through Christ instituted it for the purpose it was instituted, going to regulate it? Now, we all know, at least I hope in this room, that it's agreed that no man has the authority to regulate and control another person's worship. And this being the case, then the privilege, therefore, belongs to God and not man to regulate it as it's taught in his, the Lord's last will and testament. In attempting to escape this conclusion, there have been those who have said that God has not taught us the frequency of observing the Lord's Supper. And thus, when you examine what they do as they go about to partake or observe what they call the Lord's Supper, you may find them doing it annually or semi-annually, quarterly or monthly. And to them, that's okay. But you know, when they do that, Somebody had to come together and say, we'll regulate it and we'll do one of these. And that raises another dilemma. For if God has taught us no regular time to observe the Lord's Supper, then the person who observes it only once in a lifetime has just as much obeyed God and is just as scriptural as anyone else who does it monthly or quarterly or semi-quarterly. And you see where that gets you. The Jerusalem church, and that's where the church was established, Acts 2, that is the first church of Christ on this earth, continued steadfastly in the observance of it. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, Acts 2.42. Do you see a regularity? And do you see a frequency? And not just an occasional custom as it struck somebody's fancy to do it. It further indicates that as John wrote this second letter to this man, Theophilus, that he didn't even have to go into detail right here with Theophilus about the matter as to the frequency of it because Theophilus, Theophilus was aware of these things. Now he will later on go into some detail in explaining it, but not in this way. Well, now let me explain to you why we partake it on the first day of the week. He doesn't do that. But he does when you take the information later on, explain it. And this is where we get into it. The church at Troas came together, they assembled on the first day of the week, and it's called for the purpose, the reason they assembled was the breaking of bread. Acts 20 and verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached, as the American Standard says, discoursed with them as he intended to depart on the morrow. Are there things we can learn from this? Because we know God doesn't just put information there that won't benefit us. And as we're studying the Lord's Supper, are there things in this verse that helps us? First of all, they're taking it on the day is an approved precedent. 
We have all sorts of information regarding even when Jesus instituted the supper. We have what the bread represents, what the fruit of the vine represents. We have the Lord saying, I'm not going to partake of it again with you until I do it in the kingdom. And we know the kingdom is the church, and the church at Troas, Troas is doing it. When Paul wrote the church at uh, Corinth, they knew to do it, though they were abusing it. So Paul corrects them in the passage that we read. But it was a part of teaching them what it is to be a Christian and the proper worship as Christians. So we see the Bible talking about it. But you'll not find in those passages when to do it. You'll have as often as you do it. So as I say so many times, and we must remind ourselves of this, in studying the Bible, and seeking the authority of the Lord in the words of the Bible, and rightly dividing the word of truth, we just must take all of what the Bible says on a given topic in its proper context before we begin to reason with it and draw our conclusions. So they're taking it on that day is an approved precedent. Paul is an apostle. He's the one that established the church there. He's going along with them because they're doing what the Bible said. He waits several days, and he's in a great big hurry to get to Jerusalem so that they will meet. He knows faithful Christians will meet. And Acts 20 and 7, Luke records, they did meet, and he says to break bread. If it had been wrong, Paul would have condemned it. How do I know that? Well, just read anywhere in the New Testament you want about Paul's involvement in the church and any time error of any sort raised its head, Paul dealt with it, exposed it, refuted it, and taught the truth. The next thing is that they came together on that day, remember the first day of the week, and it's for the primary purpose of breaking bread. Now, do you think literally they're breaking bread and that's all there is to it? They actually took bread in their hands and they all sat around the assembly like this and looked at one another in a very pious way and just broke bread so that Sonia could come along and clean it all up in between the pews because you know what would happen. I'm being a bit facetious, as Kim would say, a very little but a bit. Uh, so the point is we know better than that. It's, it's, it's ridiculous to even think that's absurd. So breaking bread must mean something. Well, it wasn't just coined as a part of their vernacular to mean just the Lord's Supper. This is one of those things that came out of usage of the Greek people, speaking the Greek language in their society and culture. And it meant simply to come home and eat with me or let's eat together. If I were to say to you today, how about coming over to the house tonight and breaking bread with us? Now you're going to think that I'm saying, well, I want to go over to the Browns' house and sit around and break bread and let it fall on the floor. That'd be silly. We know that even in past times in America, that was used more as it is used here to mean come home and eat with us. But this is a special eating, a special observance. It is to remember the Lord's death till he come again. It is an act of homage and worship on the first day of the week in that assembly. So you can see then that to break bread stands at least for the Lord's Supper. But since that's not the only avenue of worship in the first day of the week assembly, and yet the death of our Lord is so important, I firmly believe it is called a synecdoche in grammar where part stands for the whole or whole for the part. And the significance and the importance of the Lord's Supper stands for the whole worship. Because you haven't worshipped God as he intends just to observe the Lord's Supper. If all there was to it, that is the worship in the first day of the week assembly, then we would just come together and do the most important thing. And what would that be if to break bread is the most important thing? It would be to observe the Lord's Supper and go home. And you can see how some people get that false view in their mind. They will come, they will observe the Lord's Supper, and they'll go home. And they think they've done God's service. That comes, no doubt, from false concepts of the Lord's Supper and the importance of it. The Lord's Supper is not any more important to the whole of the worship on the first day of the week in the assembly than is the singing or the giving of our means, or the study of the Bible, or prayer. 
But just like Jude, verse 3, contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, it takes the central core of Christianity, one's faith, which faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and lets it stand for the whole New Testament system. So to break bread in Acts 27 is a synecdoche that stands for the whole worship system by choosing that highly significant act of our Lord, his death, which makes all the rest of it possible. But whether you accept it having to do with all the worship or whether it just has to do with the Lord's Supper, it still stands for something, and at least it stands for the observance of the Lord's Supper, and that's what they did on that first day of the week, according to Acts 20 and verse 7. So it is an approved precedent. It is an act, a historical account of an act of the church. Why is it, among many, bound upon us today? Because it's a part of doing what the Lord said we're to do as often as we partake of it, which oftenness is said here to be the first day of the week. And as I said, Paul condemned it for being sinful. They came together on that day, the first day of the week, to break bread. Now, which first day of the week? You know, isn't that a silly question? No one would ask that about anything else. Which first day of the week? Well, there's only one first day of the week. Now, I understand some people may have to go to seminary to be able to grasp some of these things, learn Greek and Hebrew and go to Harvard and get a Ph.D. I'm being facetious again because I'm emphasizing the simplicity of the language to those that will just receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their soul. There's never been a week without a first day or with more than one first day. Now, that's English. I don't know why the translators did it, because in the Greek it says every first day or each first day of the week. Well, now, does this mean that they took the supper the first day of every week? Well, what would he have to say other than what he said to say that? If it does not say every week, then uh, what are we into here? Neither does it say that God commanded the Jews to keep every Sabbath day, which was the seventh day of the week. Remember, God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus 20 and verse 8, I might as well say, which Sabbath day? But he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Were they obligated to keep the Sabbath as the law of Moses prescribed the details of it? Indeed they were, as part of being faithful to God under the law. And you know, that seventh day, just like the first day, came around every week. Therefore, they were obligated to keep it every week. Now, the early disciples of our Lord met upon the first day of the week. They met, as we've studied, to break bread. They did it with apostolic approval. Now, you want to make your salvation, in this case, regarding when to take the Lord's Supper to please God, as sure as you can? Well, if we follow this approved example, won't we do that? How often shall we meet to break bread? On every first day of the week. Just as often as the first day of the week comes. And uh, like I say, that's once every week. Now, it must be admitted that the meeting together upon the first day of the week and their breaking bread, as Luke records by inspiration, occurred within the same frequency. They met together on the first day of every week, and they broke bread upon the first day of every week. Now, those who separate the breaking of bread upon the first day of the week from meeting together upon the first day of the week do a thing for which they have no authority. I think we need to understand that God in His Word, when you take all of what the New Testament teaches, says the Lord's Supper is to be taken of in the worship assembly. My brethren sometimes have decided, and they have no Bible teaching on it, they just decided that somebody can't come to the service, so they'll take the Lord's Supper to them. Okay, let's all do that. Where? Where? Is your authority for it? 
you just as well say, let's just take them to singing. Or let's just go get their contribution. That seems to be really the way people ought to think. I would say that's the way being normal humans you ought to think. Go get their money if you get anything else. No, to have your worship acceptable to God that is to be done on the first day of the week involves a duly constituted assembly of that congregation. And in that assembly, every member worshiping spirit and in truth with the right attitude toward God and as the truth directs us. And the complete worship is where we've engaged in all five acts of worship, not just one or two or three or four. There's nothing taught, not one single solitary thing taught that says go outside the assembly and do it. Yell yeah, but. I'm not interested in your yell yeah, buts. I'm interested in either a direct statement, an example, or that which is implied. That's the only way words in the New Testament of Jesus Christ that will judge us all on the last day authorizes us to do anything. And we must have, Colossians 3.17, that authority, or it cannot be by faith, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10.17. Now, will those who deny that this verse teaches that we should observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Every week. Tell us how they've learned from it that it should be done annually or semi-annually or quarterly or monthly or any other place other than the worship assembly on the first day of the week. I know nothing about it. And if somebody says, well, we ought to just do it at home as it suits us because as a family we know more about our needs than you do. Okay, I'm open to that. Just bring me the teaching of the Bible that says it. But, of course, when you do that, you know you destroy the assembly. Because this is an assembly that we're taught not to forsake. Hebrews 10, 25. And to forsake it is to not be a part of it. So, yeah, we just did it once. Yeah, you forsook it once. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. How many times do you have to forsake it before it becomes sin? How many times do you have to lie before it becomes sin? How many times must you use mechanical instruments of music like we studied last week before it becomes sin? How many times do you leave prayer out of worship of God on the first day of the week before it's sinful? Some of those are sins of commission. Some are sins of omission. Nevertheless, it's sin. And sin is a transgression of the law. And sin is the only thing that will separate any of us from God. The church at Corinth ate the Lord's Supper when they assembled which was the first day of the week. And they're even taught, we won't go into this right now, to tarry ye one for another. That's in the text. It means something. It conveys a thought to me, God's thought. That is, as we're observing the supper, we're to all observe it at the same time. I've known of churches of Christ as they've left the divine pattern to set up, such as this table was set earlier, over here on the side of the auditorium, and then any time during the worship, while the singing was going on or prayers or whatever, then people could get up when they got ready and go for and partake of it. The Lord's Supper, as is singing, as is Bible reading, as is prayer, as is contribution, are independent acts of worship, of homage to God, directed by the authority of Christ the way He wants it done. Now watch. You will never have two acts of worship going on simultaneously. People have said, well, we sang a song that had to do with the Lord's Supper while we observe it. Okay, I'll say again, wonderful. Find that in the New Testament. Well, why are you being so picky? Same reason I'm picky about the plan of salvation. But you must hear the gospel because it's the power of God to save. You must understand it. You must believe it. You must repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ. Be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To obtain the remission of forgiveness of sin. I'm no more picky on this about the Lord's Supper than I am about that when it comes to steps in the plan of salvation authorized by the New Testament. Now, if I'm adding to the Word of God, which I sin in so doing, or altering it in some way, then that ought to be obvious. But it seems to me the person that's wanting to move it over here to the side and take up it when they get ready all during the worship, no matter what other acts of worship are going on, have got to find some authority from the New Testament to do it. But if you don't believe the New Testament is a divine pattern, but it's just a discourse to tell us how much God loves us and 
thus we can pretty well be left to show him how much we love him any way it suits us, then I don't know why we assemble together anyway. We can all just stay home. And that's exactly what some people have done when it came to the importance of the gathering together of the saints of a, local, of a congregation. Just do away with it. And what happens when you begin to do all of this kind of stuff? The church vanishes. It's no longer around. It can't be organized like the New Testament says. Because all these people are meeting in family units or individuals scattered everywhere. And how in the world are elders to be put together as shepherds and do the thing the Bible says elders are to do in overseeing those elders? Or rather the church and the deacons and their work. Do you see how that these things are designed by the devil himself to just simply make the church of none effect? And why wouldn't he? It's the spiritual body of Christ with Christians, members in particular. Can you think of anything on this earth, brethren, that he would want to destroy more than the church, individual Christians living right lives every day, and in its collective function of its organization, work and worship? I can't. He's got everything else. So what do you think he's after? He's after you. And that's why Peter said, that the devil is as a roaring lion, going about seeking whom he may devour. And Paul says it would be through doctrines of demons, people speaking lies and hypocrisy. In other words, the devil has his agents just like the Lord has his agents. And as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular are the agents of the Lord, and so are those outside of Christ or apostate members. That's what Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy 4 who come along teaching doctrines that lead people away, and the church ceases to exist. Going further with the idea, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, Paul said, when therefore you assemble yourselves together, it's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. What? I thought you said those folks were trying to observe the Lord's Supper. They were, but when they corrupted it, Paul says it's not. So a corrupted Lord's Supper is not the Lord's Supper, regardless if you call it the Lord's Supper. And Paul sought to change that by writing what he did in 1 Corinthians. And uh, the thing to do to keep it from being uncorrupted is to do only what's authorized. And that's very important. It's evident that it was their practice to attempt to eat the Lord's Supper when they assembled. That's the first point. Next, if there was any regularity about their meeting together, there was also regularity about their eating the Lord's Supper. I learned that from their abuses. And next, here is the regularity about their teaching together. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. You forget that that's in 1 Corinthians 2 also. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. We must understand that it's not Acts 20 and 7 standing all alone regarding the Lord's Supper. There's something else about the assembly that takes place on the first day of the week. And that's the gathering of the funds. And there's the first day of the week and every week. And both of them ought to be done in the assembly. That's when it's to be done. Language couldn't be clear. And by the way, it seems like a lot of folks will get money every time they can get it. The denominations don't have any problem with finding out that the first day of the week for 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is every first day of the week. And any other time they can get together, which they have no authority to do. So... It was their practice to eat the Lord's Supper when they met together, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. 20. They abused it, and Paul says, therefore, it's not what you want it to be, so I'm going to tell you how to straighten it back up. It'll be what God wants it to be, and you'll be all right when you do it. It was their practice to meet together on the first day of every week. I know that from 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and I learned that about Troas, and Paul taught the same thing in every church in Acts 20 and 7. Therefore, it was their practice to eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. Now, there's a lot more about attitude and godliness and all things like that that has a bearing on every act of worship and especially the Lord's Supper. But I hope this will suffice to say we know what we're doing. It doesn't mean we can't improve on it in attitude and every act of worship, keeping our mind centered on God and why we worship in the first place. But it means there are some fundamental matters that our brethren have long ago worked out in finding denominationalism and the manuals and prayer books and the ways they had of authorizing what they did. 
But sometimes we've forgotten it. And we can fall right into the same pattern of doing certain things because it suits us and we don't see anything wrong with it, just like the people around about us. But it doesn't make them right, and it doesn't make us right. We must have a thus saith the Lord in all that we believe and practice. If you're not a child of God today, earlier we studied the plan of salvation. We urge you to believe and obey it because that's the only way you can become a Christian. As a child of God, we must remain faithful, doing only what's authorized. And if we violated that, if we sinned, we need to repent of those sins, come confessing them, and pray to our Father to forgive us. I close as I have all my sermons saying, Isn't it wonderful to know nobody needs to leave this room this morning outside of Christ or else unfaithful to Him? God wants to forgive all people. And if you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come. Hope we stand and sing.